So in this video, we're going to talk about inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammatory bowel disease is broken into either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And as you'll see today, the symptoms and the pathophysiology and what you see under a microscope and what you see grossly, at first it seems kind of random. When you're studying this and, you know, like first aid or UWorld, you, you know that there are certain symptoms and features that go with each of these diseases. But if you actually take a step back and think about what's going on, and think about things like the depth of invasion in the different GI structures, it starts to make a lot more sense. So my goal in this video is to first provide you with the differences between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And along the way, I'm going to make that more rational and make that more logical. In other words, if you've memorized something about Crohn's disease that you thought was just a random fact, I'm going to point out that it's because of X, Y, and Z that this is associated with Crohn's disease. So my goal is to really hammer home some logical details and break this down so that you're not just memorizing facts about these things, but rather you're actually understanding the disease process. At the end of the video, I'm going to give you a mnemonic that will help you separate Crohn's from ulcerative colitis, and then we'll wrap up by talking about the pharmacologic agents that are used to treat inflammatory bowel disease in sort of a quick, rapid review. So the way that I want to tackle this video today is first we'll go through the differences between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and I'll point out the differences as we go and try to make sense of everything that I'm telling you. So the first major major difference between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis is where the inflammation or where the inflammatory bowel hence the name inflammatory bowel disease where that inflammatory bowel is located. So in Crohn's disease it can happen anywhere. It can happen literally anywhere from the rectum all the way up the GI tract going as far as the mouth. So any area can be inflamed in Crohn's disease. Whereas in ulcerative colitis, it is usually limited from the rectum up until about the transverse colon and it's always continuous. So if you look at the two pictures, in Crohn's disease, the areas of inflammation can be randomly located, they can be scattered, but in ulcerative colitis, it is a continuous area of inflammation, always extending, always, always, always starting at the rectum and extending upward. So what you see here in Crohn's disease is what's referred to as skip lesions. So literally the areas skip around. So you see an area at the terminal ilium, you see a little area at the transverse colon, you see one at the descending colon, they don't have to be continuous. You can have inflammation, then a normal area of bowel, then inflammation, then a normal area of bowel. This is why you see in textbooks and in question banks, the buzzword skip lesions, because these lesions of inflammation skip around. Now, this picture only shows you what's happening in bowel. However, this can go all the way up to the mouth, so you could get it in the esophagus, skipping around at the you know different thirds of the esophagus. It can actually be in the mouth. So high yield, know that Crohn's has skip lesions, but it can go anywhere from the rectum to the mouth. Now, let's contrast that with ulcerative colitis. In ulcerative colitis, it always has rectal involvement and it's always continuous inflammation. So you see in the picture on the right that the inflammation extends from the rectum up until about the transverse colon, but it's in a continuous fashion. It does not skip around in ulcerative colitis. So again, anywhere from the rectum to the mouth in Crohn's disease, but in ulcerative colitis, it always involves the rectum. Now, in, Crohn, in, in ulcerative colitis, it always involves the rectum, but in Crohn's disease, there is one area where the inflammation is, you know, it has a, a propensity for, for being there primarily, and that's the terminal ileum shown with the blue arrow. So although in Crohn's it can be anywhere, it typically starts or has a, a focus in the terminal ileum. So those are the differences in terms of where the inflammation is located. That's probably the highest yield thing on, in this whole video. So understand that and everything else is sort of an extension. Now let's talk about what you'll see grossly if you do a colonoscopy. So in Crohn's disease, you see what's called cobblestoning. And the cobblestoning is a feature of the colon that develops as a result of these skip lesions. Now, because inflammation is skipping throughout the colon, you have alternating areas of inflammation. So you get gross changes that alternate. And as a result of that, the colon takes on this cobblestoning appearance with different alternating levels of what's called creeping fat. Now, this is a result of inflammation that skips around and, and is alternating from one point to the next. So pathophysiologically, 
because you have inflammation in one area, then normal bowel, then inflammation in the other area, there's different stages of healing going on in the bowel at different areas. And because of this, certain areas of the bowel are sort of raised up and have more fat changes to them. So that is why you see cobblestoning and creeping fat. You also have the presence of fistulas. So fistulas are full thickness connections between one layer and the next. And fistulas are very abnormal and actually very dangerous if they develop. And I'll talk about why fistulas develop, but I'll give you a little bit of a preview now. In Crohn's disease, this inflammation occurs transmurally. And when we use the word transmural, we're referring to full thickness from the superficial mucosa all the way through the deepest layer of the bowel. And because the inflammation is from top to bottom at all layers, it can create a hole in the bowel. And a hole in the bowel is a fistula. So if you've ever memorized that Crohn's disease causes transmural inflammation, then it should be no surprise to you that fistulas are more common in Crohn's disease than they are in ulcerative colitis. And the reason is because in ulcerative colitis, it's not transmural inflammation, but rather it's localized only to the superficial mucosa and submucosal layers. That's where the inflammation is in ulcerative colitis. Now, in ulcerative colitis, you see other things like deep ulcerations. Now, the word, the name of the disease is literally ulcerative colitis. And if we break that word down, colitis means inflammation of the colon. You see itis at the end and col. So colitis, col for colon, itis for inflammation. So inflammation, inflammation of the colon. And ulcerative means forming ulcers. So this disease is literally named ulcer-forming colon inflammation. So no surprise, you see deep ulcerations in the mucosa and submucosa in ulcerative colitis. Now in ulcerative colitis, you'll get the formation of pseudopolyps. So you need to memorize that as a buzzword. Pseudopolyps for UC and creeping fat and fistulas for Crohn's. These are the two pictures. Again, cobblestoning, creeping fat and fistulas in Crohn's and deep ulcerations in the mucosa and submucosa and pseudopolyps in ulcerative colitis. Now, if we look at these disease processes on x-ray, what we see in Crohn's disease is something called the string sign. Now, the string sign is due to bow wall thickening in Crohn's disease. And what you see there, the red arrows are pointing to the string sign. In this area, which is very close to the terminal ileum, you have bowel wall thickening due to skip lesions or inflammation in different areas of the bowel. And around the area where you get the transmural inflammation, the bowel wall is very thick. So if you have a barium test, it only lights up in a very thin area because you have this edematous area of bowel and all you see is that little area that's named string sign. So that is in Crohn's disease. In ulcerative colitis, you see something called the lead pipe sign. Now in ulcerative colitis, there's so much ulceration going on and, and so much superficial inflammation in the mucosa and submucosa that you actually lose the haustra. And when you lose the haustra, the bowel loses its normal appearance on x-ray with the little haustra folds in between and takes on the appearance of a very straight and rigid lead pipe. And there's a picture of what a lead pipe looks like in case you guys don't know what that is. But the red arrows are pointing to the bowel wall. And if you look, it's very smooth and bowel should not look like that. Bowel should have those haustrations between them and should look kind of like a folded up um, material, if you will. But when it takes on that really thin, straight lead pipe appearing sign, we call that the lead pipe sign on x-ray. So high yield, Crohn's disease, you see the string sign due to uh, transmural bowel wall thickening. And in ulcerative colitis, you see lead pipe sign due to mucosal and submucosal inflammation causing loss of haustra. Now let's take a look at what these look like under a microscope. So the histology is very high yield. In Crohn's disease, you see non-caseating granulomas, and these are Th1 mediated. Again, it's transmural inflammation. I cannot stress enough how important it is to understand that transmural, which means full thickness, going from superficial to deep layer, that's Crohn's disease. In ulcerative colitis, you see crypt abscesses, and I've put a red circle around them in the picture on the right. So crypt abscesses, which are Th2 mediated. Again, please know this, ulcerative colitis inflammation occurs at the mucosal and submucosal level only. So it's more superficial than Crohn's disease. If you understand the transmural versus mucosal and submucosal thing, then a lot of these other symptoms and signs make perfect sense, okay? Let's move on and talk about some other high yield associations. Crohn's disease is associated with ASCA. So you're going to be ASCA positive if you have Crohn's disease. Not always, but most of the time. And that stands for anti-saccharomyces 
Cerevisiae antibodies. Just know the association, don't worry about what it means, but if you see that come up, they're telling you that somebody has Crohn's disease. Or if they give you a patient who has signs and symptoms of Crohn's disease and then ask you for an antibody association, pick ASCA. Likewise, ulcerative colitis is associated with P. anca, which you'll see it's somebody who has primary sclerosing cholangitis. Now, historically, this was a test favorite, the primary sclerosing cholangitis, but because ASCA is a new, sexier antibody association, in my experience, I think it's a little bit higher yield to know the ASCA association, but obviously, know both of these, ANCA with UC and ASCA with Crohn's. In Crohn's disease, it's going to present with diarrhea, and in ulcerative colitis, it's also going to present as diarrhea, but it's much more likely that that diarrhea will be bloody. Now, the reason that it's more bloody in ulcerative colitis is because you have the formation of more ulcers, and ulcers tend to bleed very, very heavily. So if you understand the ulcerative ulceration formation of UC, then bloody diarrhea makes more sense. So the reason that I put this here is because if you're taking an exam and you've totally forgotten all the details of this video today, and all you see in the vignette is bloody diarrhea, and you have to make an absolute guess between Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, or whatever other GI pathology they put on there, you should guess ulcerative colitis. Now that we've talked about all of the symptoms, the radiologic findings, the histological findings, let's talk about extra intestinal associations. So these are things that you might see outside of the GI tract associated with inflammatory bowel disease. And what I'll say before we get started is that some people seem to think that some of these are associated with Crohn's and some of these are associated with UC, but the truth is, is that we don't have definitive research to suggest that it's one or the other. So I'm gonna put all of these associations here, and if you see any of them, you should think Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, but not necessarily one or the other. The first one is aphthous stomatitis. So or oral ulcers, basically. If you see this and you have to make a guess, I would pick Crohn's, because again, Crohn's can occur anywhere from rectum to mouth. But the truth is, is that this can occur in ulcerative colitis, ulcerative colitis as well. So aphthous stomatitis, if you have to guess, guess Crohn's, because again, Crohn's can go up to the mouth, but we classically see that associated with inflammatory bowel disease. Uveitis, another classic association with uh, inflammatory bowel disease. There are spondyloarthropathies that occur uh, associated with different inflammatory bowel diseases. So don't, don't forget, can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. That could all be associated with inflammatory bowel disease, but the classic symptom is uveitis. So if you see uveitis, start to think of either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Very, very high yield ones here, skin changes. Pyoderma gangrenosum, a really nasty looking skin lesion. If you see that, they're putting you in the direction, probably of ulcerative colitis, but again, could be either. Erythema nodosum, those red nodular uh, areas of the skin that form usually on the front of the shins and sort of the distribution of just below the patella and, and um, the tibia. But if you see that, guess Crohn's, classically associated with Crohn's disease, again, could be either. Um, so pyoderma, I would think you see. Erythema, I would think Crohn's, but it, there's some overlap, like I said. Pancreatitis associated with Crohn's disease, not really associated with ulcerative colitis. And then colon cancer, you have an increased risk of colon cancer with both. We used to think that ulcerative colitis gave you a much, much higher risk, but it's, it's actually both that increase your risk. So if you see a question asking you about the association, yes, inflammatory bowel disease increases your risk of colon cancer because if you think about it, the tissue is constantly undergoing inflammation. And anytime you have these changes, in tissue and you have constant inflammation and cell turnover, you increase your risk of cancer. And that's true of any organ system, not just GI. Let's talk about the pharmacology now and different agents that are used in the treatment of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Now, there's not too much to know here. You really just need to know the mechanism and maybe one or two adverse drug reactions. So the first agent is infliximab. And infliximab is a monoclonal antibody which inhibits TNF-alpha. So high yield to know that any agent that's going to inhibit or block TNF-alpha is going to increase your risk of tuberculosis. And of course, the reason is, is that when you inhibit TNF-alpha, you prevent the adequate formation of granulomas, and therefore you can't sequester off TB, and TB can do its thing in the human body. So TNF-alpha blocker, that's what infliximab does, but just remember that it can increase your risk of tuberculosis. 5-aminosalicylic acid, aka mesalamine, aka mesalazine. This is a COX pathway inhibitor, so you are decreasing inflammatory mediators that mediate the inflammation going on in the GI system.
no adverse drug reaction that you need to know associated with 5-ASA. The last two agents are very similar, so I, I group them together here, 6-mercaptopurine and azo, azathioprine. So both of these are purine synthesis inhibitors. Um, the way that the adverse drug reaction that you really need to know about, the way that this works is that these are both um, xanthine oxidase mediated allopurinol toxicity. So what the hell does that mean? Uh, allopurinol inhibits xanthine oxidase, which means that because both of these drugs are metabolized by xanthine oxidase, if somebody's taking allopurinol and then they take one of these drugs, because allopurinol is inhibiting the enzyme which breaks these drugs down, these drugs never get broken down, so they cause toxicity because their levels are so abnormally high in the body. So look for the clinical vignette where you've got a patient with gout who's on allopurinol, and all of a sudden they start treatment, um, they start this immunomodulation treatment with either azathioprine or 6-mercaptopurine, and all of a sudden they have the development of these random toxic side effects. The answer is going to be it's allopurinol inhibiting xanthine oxidase, which allows 6 mp and AZA to build up in the body. So those are really the four drugs that you need to know. Not too much to memorize there, but just important to keep in mind when you think about inflammatory bowel disease. So now that I've given you all of the information about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, I wanna give you the mnemonic. And the mnemonic is really quite simple. It's not, it's not dirty, it's not funny, it's, it's just really simple and effective. So Crohn's is one word. Ulcerative colitis is two words. So everything with Crohn's has to do with the number one, and everything with UC has to do with the number two. So Crohn's is TH1 mediated, and you see skip lesions. And of course, when you skip, you skip on one leg. There's a picture of somebody skipping on one leg. In ulcerative colitis, it's TH2 mediated, and mucus comes out of two of your nostrils or two of your nares. And remember that mucus for mucosal and submucosal in terms of where the inflammation is. So I'm gonna pause for a second because if you haven't heard it in my voice up to this point, you're gonna hear it again. It is incredibly high yield to know that ulcerative colitis, the inflammation occurs at the mucosal and submucosal level. Whereas in Crohn's, the inflammation occurs transmurally, full thickness going through from top all the way to bottom. That's why in Crohn's you see fistulas, that's why in UC you see ulcers, please know that. So mucus comes out of two nostrils or two nares, two for two words of ulcerative colitis and mucus for mucosal and submucosal. Some other things that go along with this mnemonic, Crohn's affects one spot at a time, hence the skip lesions. So it one spot, skip, one spot, skip, one spot, skip. That's why you see cobblestoning and creeping fat. Uh, Crohn's, there is string sign. String is one word, just like Crohn's. In ulcerative colitis, number two is always involved. So when you poop, you take a number two. So the rectum is always involved. And lead pipe is two words. So when we talk about the x-ray findings, string versus lead pipe. String is one word, string sign for Crohn's. Lead pipe is two words, two words for ulcerative colitis. This mnemonic is really simple. It's really stupid, but you need to keep it in mind because on test day, you're going to have questions about Crohn's and you're going to have questions about ulcerative colitis. I think that if you approach this from the perspective of understanding transmural versus mucosal and submucosal inflammation, everything else flows downstream from there and you will crush these questions on your exam.